So the original true natives of Australia are the Australian Aboriginal people who are dark skinned. They are not white people. And recently, just a few years ago, their genetics were tested through, through modern techniques. It was discovered that the Australian uh, Aboriginal people have at least at least 10 percent of their genetics are Indian, are of Indian origin. 10 percent. Approximately 10 percent of their ge of their genome is of Indian origin, and the Indian genetics were introduced in the uh, in Australia approximately 5,000 years ago. Suddenly, so all of a sudden, in the Middle East there is the emergence of Indian genetics. In uh, in Australia, there is a sudden emergence of Indian genetics, and there's also another uh, another event called the Yamnaya invasion of Europe. So, about 5,000 years ago, Europe's genetics were totally transformed by a bunch of invaders who came from somewhere in the east. So, these people, the invaders, they are today called Yamnaya. It's a Russian word. It's not an original word. Today, they are called the Yamnaya invaders. These people were mostly males. They were all horse riders. They were all warriors. Their average height was 5'10", 5'11". They were all muscular people. And they simply rampaged through Europe. And what happened was a complete, almost complete genetic replacement event. So the Chinese, the Chinese want to project themselves as a very large, very major and very responsible world power. Right now, they are still a very major nation. They are the second largest economy in the world. And they have these aspirations of becoming a superpower, which is not going to happen. But right now, they are still a very major economy and a very powerful nation. So they want to project an image that they are better than the US. And they can succeed where the US has been failing for decades. So that's what they're doing. It's about creating a projection of, of, of an image of soft power projection and all that. And for India, it's fine. It's for India, it's not a problem. I don't think India should go and try to mediate in all kinds of fights and problems in the world. What do we get out of it? Because Saudi and Iran want to join BRICS and now China is their way to in, uh, BRICS. Maybe India could have done Mr. so. They Modi, have more support. Mr. Modi has excellent relations with Mr. Mohammed bin Salman. When it comes to Mr. Modi, I don't see him being popular anywhere outside India. The Pakistanis have no great love for him. The Chinese have no great love for him. The Americans... Democrats don't love. If you, if you, all you have to do is to read the the media, the Western media, whether it is the BBC, whether it is the CNN or Fox News or New York Times or the or Washington Post or whatever, the Guardian. Does any of them write anything good about him, which tells you that he is doing something good for you? <laughs> Even Indian media don't. <laughs> yeah, Indian media. Uh, let's not name them, but we know who they are. So, I welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, मेरा नाम सात्विक जाजू है एंड आई एम योर होस्ट फॉर टुडे आनविक जी की विचार मंच uh, ये नाम से शुरू करने का जो मीनिंग था वो मैं बता देता हूँ तो आनविक जी की का मतलब होता है साइंस ऑफ इंक्वायरी और स्पिरिट ऑफ इंक्वायरी और इन्वेस्टिगेटिव स्पिरिट टू बिल्ड बेटर एंड न्यूअर परस्पेक्टिव एंड हम लोग वही चीज़ करने आए यहाँ सो so इससे बेटर नाम नहीं हो सकता था तो दैट्स हाउ इट इज टूडे वी हैव अभिजीत चावड़ा जी विद अस so let's give it a come on uh, it is his second time so we are very grateful that he has uh, accepted our invitation introduction ki zarurat to hai nahi but fir bhi dena to chahiye formally uh, so uh, abhijit ji is a theoretical physicist by profession and uh, he's he can be called a historian and a geopolitical expert because of his hobbies of reading history since his childhood like when i think you were 5 or 6 7 years old so inki jo hold hai history pe wo itni strong hai jo hame abhi dikhi jayegi thode time mein fir se so yeah there's also uh, he runs a youtube channel with the name abhijit chawda there are a lot of good videos please do go and watch there to aapko aur knowledge milegi varied uh, podcast karte hain he invites uh, eminent guests to bahut sari cheeze hai Sir, on to you now. So, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you so I, much, I and it's great to be back <laughs> on this wonderful platform. Okay. So uh, today uh, we have the topic of migration theory hmm. uh, about our DNA. So we'll start with that. Then we'll move on to geopolitics. There is a geopolitics update because uh, the world is going through so much right now. So it's interesting to have a look on it. Uh, maybe not so good to experience it. So let's start, sir. Okay, so when we talk about migration theory and DNA and all that, we're talking about the out of India migration or into India migration, yes. which has been historically called the Aryan invasion theory. Yes. 
So uh, when the foreigners came to India, when the British came to India, they decided that they will rewrite India's history. Okay. Because our historical texts were all destroyed in the destruction of the great universities. Nalanda, Takshashila, Tilhara, Sharda Peet and so on and so forth. Everything was destroyed. So we had no more written records of our history. So when the British came to India, they said that you Indians, you Hindus are ahistorical. You did not bother to write your history. So we will write your history now. So then they set about writing India's history. They created the ASI, Archaeological Survey of India, which was an organization whose objective was to discover the various archaeological uh, sites in India, classify them, categorize them and steal whatever was valuable. So if you go to London, we have the great uh, British Museum or something it's called. It's an active crime scene. You know, idols everywhere. All the other wonderful treasures are stored over there. All of that was taken out using the services of the ASI, Archaeological Survey of India. I'm not saying the ASI is like that today, but that is the origin of the ASI. Those museums are also known as Chor Bazaar, right? I don't know what they're called. <laughs> those are active crime scenes because yeah. those are all, all stolen items. So we have lots of museums like the, the Guggenheim, the Met Museum in New York, whatnot. So that is one thing they did. The other thing they did is that they, their historians and, and experts, scholars, start, tried to study Sanskrit texts. So they learned Sanskrit. They tried to, one of the reasons to study and, and to learn Sanskrit was to figure out how much wealth was stored in the temples. Because in the oh. temples, all the records were in Sanskrit. So that was, I think, the primary reason why they wanted to learn Sanskrit. But then they also were able to study some Indian historical texts like the, like the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas and so on. So they started getting some knowledge of about India's past. The interesting thing they noticed is that Sanskrit sounded quite similar to certain European languages like Greek and Latin, etc. So then they came up with this theory. I, th I think it was, uh, uh, what was his name? The German guy? Max Miller, Max Miller, yes, I was, yeah, I was thinking of Max Planck, but it's Max Miller. So Max Miller came up with this theory that some superior race of people lived in Europe, white skinned people who spoke Vedic Sanskrit and they came, uh, they invaded India and Europe at the same time. So one branch of these people, they, they, it came into India and Iran, Persia, the other branch went into Europe and in India the natives were very, very uh, primitive and very backward, so they were easy to conquer. And that's how Hinduism and Sanskrit came into India. So that is the Aryan invasion theory. It's a complete myth because now we have evidence that completely disproves it. So that is the genetic evidence. So the, the science of genetics became a real valuable and potent tool with the advent of the 20th, 21st century. Until the 20th century, all the evidence we had was based on archaeological records, the opinions of historians and some textual evidence, inscriptional evidence and so on. But now this new science has appeared on the, it's become a very big thing, the science of genetics. So genetics has opened up a whole new way of trying to understand history. And in India, very little genetic research has been done. Lots of it has been done in other countries. But now when it comes to genetics, it shows that there was no such great invasion into India. First of all, even from the archaeological record, there is no archaeological evidence at all of a big, large scale or even small scale invasion into India around 1500 BC. Nothing. Absolutely no evidence. Okay, till 1500 BC, nothing. Even after that. Okay, even after that. E until the Hunnic invasions of India, there is no archaeological ev uh, evidence. Of invasion. Of any, any invasion into India. So, Max Muller claimed that this invasion happened around 1500 BC. So, there is absolutely no archaeological evidence of that. And when, it, when, it, when we look at the genetics of India, we find that India has the most genetically diverse population in the world outside of Africa. And then we find that India's genetic lineages, matrilineal and patrilineal lineages are extraordinarily old. The oldest non-African patrilineal haplogroup, which is lineage, is haplogroup F. It's about 55 or 60,000 years old and it originated in the Indian subcontinent. So this is a direct outcome of the out of Africa migration, which is believed to happen to have happened around 80 to 70,000 years before today. And the oldest non-African matrilineal lineages, haplogroups are haplogroups M and N, which are about 65 to 70,000 years old. They also originated in the Indian subcontinent. So the oldest non-African genetic lineages, which account for more than 90% of the non-African population, originated in India. 
So that tells you a certain um, certain story. Now they say that, that that is very old history, but Hinduism and Sanskrit came from elsewhere. So first of all, there is no genetic connection between your genetics and your religion or your language. If an Indian person converts to Christianity, will their genetics also become different? If an English Indian person starts speaking French, will their genetics become French? No. So genetics has nothing to do with language and culture and religion. But they try to make, claim that there is a link, which is complete nonsense. So if then they talk about the R1A haplogroup. R1A is, is a very widespread uh, genetic patrilineal genetic lineage, bloodline you could say, which is found in great abundance in India, in the Indian subcontinent and also in Europe. So clearly there is a genetic connection between India and Europe. So they claim that, that is, this is the evidence of the Aryan invasion. My question is, how do we know where it originated? So there is a way of knowing genetically how, where a haplogroup originates. The, the geographical region where you have the highest diversity within that haplogroup is the place of origin. So that is most likely going to be India. The research is still happening. The results are not officially published yet. So I can't make the claim yet, but it's going to be India. So even this Indo-European haplogroup that we find, it will have, it will be demonstrated that it originated in India. So that is the genetic thing. Now there is much more in genetics. It's not even, it's not just human genetics. There are animal genetics too, which play a role in this. For instance, uh, when we look at the genetics of cattle, cows and you know cows and bulls we find a very strange thing that happens in the Middle East in the Middle East we have cattle which are Middle Eastern cattle we have cattle in Africa we have cattle in Europe when we ch when we study the genetics of cattle in the Middle East we find that approximately 5,000 years ago or four and a half thousand years ago something strange happens some new genes appear in the gene pool all of a sudden and these are the, gene, the, the genes of zebu cattle. The zebu cattle uh, species or subspecies is the Indian cattle. It is the cattle that are depicted on Harappan seals. The bull with the big hump on his back and the long, you know, the, this uh, the, 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 the fold of skin be below the chin. So that is the zebu bull. So all of a sudden, about four and a half or five thousand years ago, there is this sudden appearance of Indian cattle genes in the Middle East and also eventually in Africa. So the oldest evidence of Indian cattle in Africa is dated at least 4000 years before today in Egypt. So we have to understand one thing that animals, especially cattle, they don't decide one day let's go for a migration. It doesn't happen like that. These are domesticated animals. They will migrate only when their masters migrate. So this indicates that Indians went to the Middle East and that's how the genetics of bull of cattle was it was um, you know introduced there also in africa so this is an event that happens about roughly let's say 5000 years before today and later we find that in the middle east in the anatolia and syria region there appeared entire kingdoms whose aristocratic class was indo aryan which means they spoke sanskrit they okay. spoke how do we know the source spoke Sanskrit? Because we have inscriptional evidence. Clay tablets. There is a very famous clay tablet. It is a horse training manual. It is authored by a gentleman whose name was Kikuli. Kikuli the Mitanni. He belonged to the Mitanni Empire. So he wrote the, the, the entire horse training manual, which can still be used today. He wrote it in the local Hurrian language. But certain terms you know, specific technical terms he could not use. He did not know the Hurrian terms for that. So he had to use his own language, which was Vedic Sanskrit. So it is a Hurrian text in which certain terms are Sanskrit terms. Navavartana, for instance, nine revolutions or nine, nine, nine uh, circuits and so on. So we find Sanskrit terms in this Hurrian text. And that is the oldest actual inscriptional evidence of Sanskrit anywhere in the world, strangely enough. So we find that in the Middle East, Indians went there and they were the ruling class in the Hurrian, uh, in the Mitanni Empire and also in the Hittite Empire. So the 90%, 95% of the population, they were the locals, but the rulers were Indians. So that is one thing. Uh, and we also find around the same time, around 5000 years ago, the sudden appearance of Indian genetics in Australia. 
So today, if you look at Australia, we see the white people there, English speaking people, but they appeared in, they came into Australia only 200 or so years ago. The true natives of Australia are the aboriginal people yes. who have been there for at least 60,000 years. Today, they are marginalized. They are almost wiped out. Their lands have been stolen from them. They have been completely genocided in Tasmania. And even today, they are second class or third class citizens in Australia. They have no real rights. So they, they lecture us about human rights and all that, but this is how they treat the actual so natives of Australia. Uh, the American blueprint was applied there, there also. It is the Anglo-Saxon blueprint, whether it is North America or Australia or New Zealand. And the typically is the Christian Even blueprint. New Zealand has Maoris, right? Maoris yeah. are only about 15-20% now. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so the original true natives of Australia are the Australian Aboriginal people who are dark skinned. They are not white people. And recently, just a few years ago, their genetics were tested through, through modern techniques. It was discovered that the Australian uh, Aboriginal people have at least at least 10% of their genetics are Indian, are of Indian origin. 10%? Approximately 10% of their, ge of their genome is of Indian origin. And the Indian genetics were introduced in, the, uh, in Australia approximately 5,000 years ago. Suddenly. So all of a sudden, in the Middle East, there is the emergence of Indian genetics. In, uh, in Australia, there is a sudden emergence of Indian genetics and there's also a, another, uh, another event called the Yamnaya invasion of Europe. So about 5000 years ago, Europe's genetics were totally transformed by a bunch of invaders who came from somewhere in the east. So these people, the invaders, they are today called Yamnaya. It's a Russian word, it's not an original word. Today they are called the Yamnaya invaders. These people were mostly males. They were all horse riders, they were all warriors. Their average height was 5'10", 5'11". They were all muscular people. And they simply rampaged through Europe. And what happened was a complete, almost complete genetic replacement event. Which means that until that time, whatever genetics you had in Europe, male genetics disappeared overnight. And this new male genetics from the East appeared in Europe. So what happened was very brutal, but this is what happened. They killed all the men and took all the women. That's what happened. So this bursts the myth that India has never uh, invaded or Indians have never invaded. So we, st we still don't know. There is okay. still no consensus thus far thus that far. the Yamnaya were of Indian origin. We know their the, the uh, genetic lineage that most of them ha had. It was called the R1B haplogroup. Okay. In India, we have a significant amount of R1A and a small amount of R1B. Okay. But most likely the R1 haplogroup and the R haplogroup itself, which is the original haplogroup, the parent haplogroup, that also most likely originated in India. So if that is confirmed, then clearly the Yamnaya are descendants of Indians. Yeah, so because one of the videos I've seen, uh, mm. w was watching of you earlier, mm. you had said that uh, they used to first uh, believe that it has come from Europe, but now they have accepted that it has come around Iran and now slowly you think that it will they have to accept eventually. You are right. So a new uh, research paper has come out by Dr. David Reich and uh, his team members uh, which talks about the Southern Arc hypothesis or the Southern Arc, uh, Southern Arc theory. So if you look at the map, the Southern Arc which they are referring to, yeah, you can see, yeah. is essentially the Anatolia, Syria and Iraq, Iran region. So earlier they claimed that the Aryans came from Europe. Then they said that they came from the Middle East, the uh, Ukraine region. That was the Aryan migration theory. Now they say that they came from further east, which is the southern arc, which essentially goes up to Iran. So it's going further and further and further east, east you know, yeah. further and further east. You wait for 10 years, they will say it came from India. Or maybe they will not say. Mm -hmm. what will they actually accept because they... Eventually in science, you have to accept the evidence, right? So they will maybe not publicize it as much. They will make it very slow and they will couch it in very scientific language. Even the, the Southern Arc paper that David Reich and his, uh, his, his co-authors wrote, it, it, what they say is that it originates somewhere in Iran, but the language they've used is so confusing that most people won't understand what they're what they referring to. You know? okay. so and Iran is uh, some civilization which is a sister civilization? Iran actually geographically is part of the Indian subcontinent. There is okay. no barrier between India and Iran. You can just walk all the way to Iran if you want. Okay. Yeah. So and, and Iran, the Persian Empire, the Hakshamanish Empire was an offshoot of Indian Indian people. Right? The, if you if you read the Behistun in inscription, there is a place called Behistun in Iraq, I Iran, where you have the, an inscription written by Darius. King Darius. 
So Behistun, this Iranian place, was once called Bhagasthan. The original Bhagastan. name was Bhagasthan. It is now called Behistun. Darius, he writes his, his story and the story of his ancestors in this inscription. If you read it, it's in the cuneiform script, which we don't understand. But if you read the transliteration, it sounds almost exactly like Sanskrit. The old Persian language was a upper branch language of Sanskrit, just like Pali and the other uh, Prakrit languages. So Persian came out of India. The Persian Empire, the, the, peop the people of Persia were descendants of Indians. Indians who migrated east, uh, westwards. So when it comes to Persia, it's very much Indian. Today, the people of Persia are not that Indian. There, are, there is a lot of intermixing with Arabs and Turks. So okay? Parsi, is it um, related Haan. to Hindu? So the Parsis who came to India, they came to India as refugees to escape the, the Arabic, the Arabic okay. invasion of Persia. Those Parsis, they were the pure blood Parsis, the pure blood Persians. Okay. If you see the Parsis of India, yeah. they don't have blonde hair, they don't have blue eyes. Oh, so they were the blonde hair and blue eyes. So today in Iran, you will find some people who have blonde hair and blue eyes or green eyes or whatever. Those are not the pure Iranians. Those are not the original Iranians. There has been a lot of intermixing from outside after the Arabic invasion of Iran, which happened for 1300 or so years ago. Yeah, Because this is something very new. I've, I'm hearing for the first time. Uh, <laughs> no knowledge about it. Know where it is taught to us. So this is a news. So the standard proper Iranian person has light brown skin, dark hair and brown eyes. Okay. That's how a real Iranian person looks. But today in Iran, we have people who actually are of Azerbaijani origin or Turkic origin or Arabic origin. And most people are mixed up. So you don't have the real Iranian uh, appearance unless you go to some parts of Iran. I think in Tehran, the standard Iranian look is, is light brown skin, dark hair, black hair and, and brown because eyes. Because that's what we have learned about it. So yeah. 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 So they say that the uh, now the Aryan invasion, migration, whatever happened, it happened from the southern arc, which is up to Persia, Iran. So I would just like to interrupt and ask a question. Yeah. You started with Aryan invasion theory. Mm. Now it has changed to Aryan migration theory. Yeah, because they did not find any evidence of invasion. So they, uh, they changed it to migration. But it was not an invasion. It was a, a wave of sm small migrations. So, uh, so now what happens is how we have disproven it or we refute it. Mm. So, once again, if you claim there is a migration, there has to be evidence. Okay. Hmm? Let's say we call the America, the conquest of the Americas a migration. Let's say we call it a migration. Well, you can see the evidence in the archaeological record. All the native temples yeah. and buildings disappear and new architecture comes up, which is of European origin. If you see the architecture and the archaeological record in Turkey, before the Turks arrive, it is all Greek. You can see the difference in architecture. Like you can see the evidence of a migration, invasion, whatever. So even if there was a migration into India, suddenly the culture will change, which means the architecture will change, the dress style will change, the, the kind of utensils you use changes, pottery changes. Where is it? If you, see the, no evidence about that. if you see the archaeological record in India, there is unmistakable evidence of complete cultural continuity going back 10,000 years. So if you see archaeological artifacts from let's say 6, 7,000 years ago, the Harappan uh, pottery figurines of human beings, you will see female figurines with Mangme Sindur, which could date back 6, 7,000 years which is what people still practice today. So it's not come from Europe or somewhere. Yeah, no one does that. Yeah, and, and when the Greeks came to India, uh, during the Mauryan times, there was this Greek ambassador called Megasthenes, who was the ambassador in uh, our emperor Chandragupta's court. So he wrote about India in his, uh, in, his, in his book called the Indica or whatever it was called. And he wrote that Indians were divided into seven classes, not four, four classes, four castes, but seven classes. And he wrote that the Indians had a calendar that starts in 6,600 something BC. That's eight and a half thousand years before today. So if Indians, so if, if, if there was a migration of outsiders into India who brought this calendar and who brought the Hinduism and Sanskrit, why is the same calendar not found anywhere in Europe? And uh, if we go back to 6,000 BC, I think there was a Stone Age or something going Europe on. Europe was in the Dark Stone Ages, yeah. yeah. But we had this extremely advanced calendar. So if you look at all the evidence put together, there is absolutely no evidence of a migration or an invasion. So earlier it was Aryan invasion theory. Now it is an Aryan migration theory. Tomorrow it will be Aryan tourism theory. Then it will be Aryan picnic theory. 
that's that's how it's going to go yeah so right now they still stick to migration now th- right now the official consensus is migration so even after being uh, disproven they are still not allowing it to well we need to uh, see more genetic results coming out of india thus far the indian government until very recently did not allow any genetic testing to be done on indians for whatever reason i don't know what the reason is but now we have our own geneticists like dr neeraj rai and etc uh, the birbal sahani institute in in lucknow and other places so we now have the capability to do some gen- genetic t- testing of our own in our population so once we have sufficient genetic data of indians itself done in india then we will have the big picture so we are waiting for that so i think uh, the research is more or less the data has been collected more or less and we are just waiting for the paper to be published and once we have that it will be dud ka dud pani ka pani <laughs> yeah <laughs> so now um we have heard about thor thor uh, because of marvel uh, cinematic universe being so hit he ha- he is a thunder god he has a hammer and he wields it with the thunder etc but as a, uh, everyone knows here uh, we all are a huge fan of yours you talk about some connection between one of our own god between thor zeus and uh, maybe two or three more gods here so what's the connection right so if we examine the features the characteristics of thor it's an interesting story very interesting god he is the most powerful of the gods of the nordic pantheon he has two primary weapons one is the vajra i mean the, the thunderbolt there you go thunderbolt yeah. the other is the hammer two primary weapons and his story is that he was called upon by the other gods to defeat a great sea monster a sea snake called yormungandr so this great sea serpent or dragon or whatever you want to call it he had encircled all the oceans of the world and the uh, world was now suffering from drought because all the water was gone and the gods were not powerful enough to defeat this great snake so they had to imp- implore thor to go and fight this great snake and thor went and defeated the sea monster and the world was saved so that is the story of thor there is a god called zeus zeus pater pater means father zeus pater is the primary the strongest greek god he also is a thunder god and a hammer god he also defeats a great sea monster called typhon who had swallowed the oceans or whatever the romans acquired the same god zeus pater and made him jupiter hmm? and the same story happens uh, there is a slavic god called perun he is a thunder god he also has the same attributes now if you read encyclopedia encyclopedia britannica the 1900 something <coughs> version it says that jupiter the oldest of the european gods from which uh, sorry zeus pater zeus the oldest of the european gods on whom the other gods are based like uh, jupiter and thor the word zeus pater comes from dios pitru dios pitru is the oldest rigvedic god he is the father of indra so when it comes to the greek god zeus pater who is essentially dios pitru the same name they have combined the characteristics of the old rigvedic god dios pitru and the greatest god indra who is his son so if we look at the story of indra he was the strongest of the vedic gods and there was a a He's goddess there, there there was a goddess called uh, danu and she was the mother of an asur called vritra so vritra was an evil evil fellow and he took the form of a great sea serpent and he swallowed the oceans and then the gods were forced to go to indra please save us we have no more water so indra needed a big weapon to defeat this great sea serpent vritra so it was fashioned out of the bones of maharishi dadichi i think oh yeah dadichi it was called vajra so vajra is not only a hammer it is also a thunderbolt it is a dual kind of weapon so indra then had to fight vritra for 365 days eventually vritra was defeated and the oceans were freed again so the oldest literature in the world is the rigveda and in that in in the vedic tradition we have this story so clearly all these other gods in europe whether it is perun whether it is uh, zeus pater whether it is jupiter whether it is thor it all came later so clearly this is all inspired by or a copy of the old rigvedic uh, 
god indra and his story and overall if you look at the pantheon of the gods in the european systems they are it's all essentially copied from the rigvedic pantheon they are also polytheistic uh, polytheistic there was a single culture across eurasia starting from india in the east all the way to uh, the irish islands in the west a single culture with lots of very different and unique local manifestations so each each region had had its own way of celebrating the culture and they all looked quite different sometimes but it was all the same culture overall and that's what was destroyed about 1500 or so years ago with the advent of christianity in europe so the europeans have lost their culture they are now practicing a whole wholly different culture which is not theirs yeah but um, honestly uh, as a millennial i never knew about this especially dios pitro which who is one of our gods today or we also don't remember him anymore how many of uh, you do you know uh, like are you l- hearing it for the first time i i'm sure yeah, yeah i think even my father is would be uh, knowing and he's like he knows a lot about it so, so dios pitro was the original he was the father of indra he is the oldest most likely the oldest rigvedic god so he was part and his his consort was prithvi mata dios pitro and prithvi mata it was like the sky father and earth mother and there is something you find in tengrism in the mongol religion yeah, also yeah yeah uh, <laughs> that uh, th- there's some uh, weird things that they cannot be together but they are uh, in love with each other something like that um you talked about danu uh, being mm-hmm. mother of vitra interesting so story there's there. a very strong uh, connection yeah, there yeah yeah let's let's talk about danu so danu is the 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 she was an asura goddess she was uh, she is a goddess of the rigveda she is a river goddess in the rigveda okay and uh, there is the story right we all know that the, the, the asuras and the and the and the gods the danavas and the gods were enemies and they eventually they fought and eventually the danavas were defeated and they were exiled and they disappear from the from the written, written record now the the danava clan essentially means the sons of danu okay the children of danu that's what it means when you say danava so she is like the first mother of she is the mother of the danavas okay so the danavas were were bad guys they were asuras and they were bad and that's why they fought with our people and they were defeated and they were exiled which means we never hear of them again in indian literature which looks like an actual exile out of india now if you look at this skith you know there were these people called the shakas the skithians who were indian origin people who ruled all across central asia the skithian word for river is danu and the sarmatian word for water is danu and if you look at eastern europe if you look at eastern europe there are so many rivers here like the don danube dniester dniper dunayek and so on which are all named after the river goddess danu the etymological root word of all the names of these rivers is danu for instance we have the danube one of the greatest rivers in europe it is named after danu we have the danu apara the danu astara the upper and lower danu dniper and dniester in ukraine yeah the it's really common nowadays to hear that word the city of kiev is built on the dniper yeah. right so all these rivers were named after danu okay so we we have a whole bunch of rivers in europe all named after danu it kind of traces the westward migration of the danava people so the question is where did the danava people end up if they actually migrated out of india and westwards so if we go to ireland the mythological history of ireland is interesting the oldest people of ireland are called the tuatha de danann which means the people of the goddess danu Okay so Danu is an Irish goddess she is a river goddess and she is the mother of the original Irish people that is the mythological story in Ireland now i spoke about the fact that Danu was the mother of Vritra so in the story of Thor the story story of Thor in the viking uh, mythology we also had this great sea serpent called Jormungandr right he also had a mother her name is Angerboda okay so the uh, and she was a giantess which means that she was a like rakshas 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 yes so she was a nordic viking rakshas rakshasi and mm-hmm. she was the mother of this great uh, sea serpent jormungandr so the viking uh, mythological goddess or whatever she is she is angerboda is their uh, counterpart to our danu that's what it was so we find the same story everywhere everywhere you know 
so this is this can also be the basis of refuting aryan invasion theory yeah but it uh, it has to be be backed up with other way evidence also yeah so this is a multidisciplinary jigsaw puzzle and all the pieces that we find they all point in that direction only but the key component most likely is the genetic component so once we have that piece of data information it's kind of sealed yeah even uh, Lithu lithuanians uh, have ashwins the twin horse yes uh, on their top of their houses you yes. said that yes i had tweeted about that yeah. so if you go to lithuania it's a symbol of of auspiciousness just like the swastika the ashwins two horse heads on 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 the roof of their houses so lithuanian culture is actually very interesting very the language is quite similar in some ways to sanskrit their old culture was very polytheistic and all that yeah so it's very interesting the old history of europe is fascinating the celtic people the slavic people the baltic people the the nordic people all they are all people who practiced different versions of the same culture which is the indo european culture which originates in the vedic culture and uh, I, I, we are kept unaware of this we don't build our pride around this we have inferiority complex towards white people and we don't believe it because we are we feel inferior yeah aisa ho hi nahi sakta yeah if you, if i tell any random person nahi nahi you are of here ye kitna jhoot bol raha hai kya bol raha hai kuch bhi bol raha hai yeah yeah that's so, what it is so uh, is there any uh, romanis are they responsible for uh, no. because they were the romanis came much 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 later much later so yeah so the event we're talking about is at least 5000 bc or somewhere 5000 years before today maybe 4500 bc or somewhere around, around that time so that is the yamnaya invasion of europe it, it happened at that time so the romanis were much later they were 5000 years later but uh, maybe for spreading our dna more because as they were forced to be assimilated maybe a very small extent but the majority of the okay. dna spread was done by the yamnaya it had already been done yes yes okay so that is the elaborate story on what the migration and dna theory is now we'll move on move on to our favorite part which is geopolitics and i think everyone is excited for that so um recently i've been tell uh, saying so we have been hearing very rarely but i was able to pick on this there's an act in us uh, laws that is known as hague invasion act but hague is in netherlands so what is it about <laughs> so there is something called the international criminal court okay which uh, is headquartered in the hague netherlands the hague is a, is a city it's a town in the netherlands and which is the headquarters of the international criminal court so recently we may have heard of the fact that the icc international criminal court has put out an arrest warrant for vladimir putin yeah okay some of us may have heard of it yeah so that is the icc the international criminal court now in the past the americans have said that the icc international criminal court is an extremely corrupt organization they have said that okay. uh, mike pompeo has said that and other other americans uh, american officials have also said this and the icc it is its duty or or its its uh, purpose its uh, agenda is to uh, prosecute people who are accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity and things like that now when it comes to the us if you look at the history of the 20th century the one nation that has perpetrated the most war crimes and crimes against humanity is the us whether it is vietnam whether it is the untold regime change operations in africa whether it is assa assassinations of african leaders whether it is the horrific genocide of almost 2 million people in indonesia suharto sukarno regime change nobody remembers that today and so much more whether it is the korean war whether it is the testing of atomic weapons on civilians in hiroshima and nagasaki more crimes against humanity have been done by the us than anybody else in the world so when the international criminal court exists to prosecute such crimes it makes sense for the americans to have some kind of vaccine that actually works against such against that not like the pfizer vaccine which doesn't work <laughs> the pfizer vaccine has killed more people than it has saved you know so the americans uh, create uh, came up with this uh, piece of legislation a law i think it was passed some i don't remember when maybe 20 years ago i don't remember the official name of of this act but the unofficial name is the hague invasion act so it according to this law that they have passed if any american citizen or official is prosecuted by the international criminal court and if that person is arrested and put in jail 
the america the, the united states of america has the right to invade the netherlands and the hague and to liberate its citizens so is this uh, accepted in netherlands this act who cares the americans are powerful enough to do it okay so when it's they their world when they invade a nation does it matter whether these people accept it or not but they usually say we are here for uh, freedom and democracy so of people so they will say it is all freedom and democracy the, the icc is corrupt and it is Im- impinging on our citizens freedom and democracy they can say anything when they bombard a nation they say that we are bringing bringing freedom and human rights to you you had a nation called libya the highest living standards in africa okay extremely good infrastructure everything was there the americans destroyed the nation today you have slave markets in 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 daylight in libya just because there was a dictator and not a democracy okay let's talk about dictatorship and de- democracy right so recently we are talking about the icc right international criminal court so just a last month or so then a, a interesting piece of news came out and the piece of news is that the biden administration wanted to present a dossier of alleged russian human rights abuses to the international criminal court so joe biden the democratically elected president of the us and his administration they had prepared a dossier of alleged hu- uh, russian human rights abuses and they were going to give it to the international criminal court you know what the news report said new york times and all that it said that the pentagon blocked the biden administration so but, but us is a presidential yeah. republic right yeah it is what what it is so it has a democratically elected president and his government and they wanted to do something and the unelected military industrial complex the defense uh, establishment blocked the president and his administration this from doing something like pakistan actually so exactly so the relationship between the pentagon and the white house is exactly the same as the relationship between rawal pindi and islamabad i was just joking but is are you serious about i am absolutely 100% dead serious because we can't we have never imagined us to be l- equated with pakistan think about it is joe biden capable of running a country no is kamala harris capable of running a country no. she is incompetent so somebody is running the country somebody is the question is who is running the country it clearly shows Deep now state. that the president is not running the country and the pentagon can block the president and his government from doing something yeah which means that the pentagon is more powerful than the white house which means the us is not a democracy first of all in china we have what a one party system only chinese communist party in north korea we have a one party system in india we have thousands of parties in the us there are two parties it is just one step above south uh, china the us is just one step above china technically they have more parties but if you want to be elected president you can only be in, be in one of two parties the republicans and the democrats it is such an unnatural system it's a fake system it is just one step above a one party system and they call themselves a democracy and now it is very clear that the pentagon is more powerful than the white house it can block the white house anytime it wants so this has completely exposed the charade that is democracy in the us the us is just like uh, if you imagine pakistan as a superpower that's what the us is that's what it, it is it actually makes a lot of sense now because we see joe biden we see kamala harris and then we are consti- uh, constantly hearing about deep state pentagon cia fbi especially after twitter files have come up it is da- making a lot of uh, you know uh, some doubts are seeding into people's mind so let's move on to the next uh, the most happening thing ukraine war so is there any update and you have recently told about transistria i am very <laughs> bad with that pronunciation about moldova uh, mm-hmm. so is it connected or is it a separate thing yeah that the, we have to understand what's happening about transnistria we have to go back to the days of the breakup of the ussr okay, okay. so the ussr was a much larger entity than than russia what it is today uh, all the central asian republics were part of the ussr kazakhstan tajikistan uzbekistan kyrgyzstan and so on so forth azerbaijan uh, we had the baltic republics like lithuania latvia estonia and we had georgia also and and so on and th- then we had nations like ukraine and moldova and belarus that were also part of the ussr so if we go to moldova if we go uh, to the border 
of Moldova, you will find a place, I forget the name of the town, but there is, so let's first look at the history, what happened, okay. So Moldova was a part of the USSR. Now the USSR in the late uh, 1980s started show, uh, showing signs of, of cracks within. Because uh, the administration was not powerful anymore. Mikhail Gorbachev had come up with Glasnost and Perestroika, which I'm sure nobody remembers. So, uh, so the, 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 uh, the strong sh state was kind of disintegrating. And by 1990, it was on the verge of breaking up. So when it became clear that the USSR is now no longer a viable entity, the government is not powerful enough, then lots of nations, lot of, lots of republics started declaring independence. Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova, Latvia, Lithuania, and so on and so forth. So in the case of Moldova, they declared their independence, but the USSR had a very large arms depot in the uh, Transnistria region. I spoke about two, reg two rivers named after Danu, Dnieper and Dniester. So there is a river called the Dniester which runs through Moldova. Can you see this blue river here? I can promise you this is the Dniester. Yeah, this is the Dniester. So on the, on the, on the western bank, on the eastern bank of the Dniester, you have a Russian majority region. So the people who live on the, on the western bank of this river are mainly of Russian and Ukrainian ethnicity. They are not of Romanian ethnicity. And Moldova is mainly a Romanian ethnicity nation. The official language, or Mo Moldovian or Moldavian, whatever they call it, is actually Romanian. Okay. But the people who live on this side of the river, Nystad, they are of Russian ethnicity. So they declared that they wanted to be part of Russia and not part of Moldova. Then there was a civil war kind of situation. And then the Russians sent in peacekeepers. And today it is like a divided territory. Okay. And they have a capital city of, uh, what is it, Tiraspol. The, the city of Tiraspol is the capital city of Transnistria. So Transnistria is this region, this thin sliver of land on the west bank of the Dniester River. And today there is an enormous arms depot in one of these small still. towns. Still today, okay. till today, which dates back to the Soviet era. It has so much ammunition that it can, d if you blow it up all together, it is bigger than a nuclear bomb. You know, so that's that's how much uh, ammunition is there, and there are Russian peacekeeping soldiers there, so who are who are keeping uh, you know the the region and the and the ammunition depot safe from any any takeover. So that is the story of Transnistria. It is it is kind of disputed territory. The Moldovans want it, but the Russians they are keeping it uh, safe from the Moldovans. And there are other territories also, like for example, in Georgia, where is Georgia? Here it is. So in Georgia also there are territories that are uh, essentially in Russian hands and all that. So there are certain territories of the USSR that are kind of disputed, uh, that have disputed status right now and Transnistria is one of them. So recently the Ukrainians tried to uh, send drones over that arms depot in Transnistria and uh, the government of Transnistria has said that we are aligned with Russia. We will always support okay, Russia. That's our official, official line that they will always support Russia. So uh, the thing is that the NATO allies would definitely want to grab that ammunition, but they can't. Because if they try to grab it, it will be blown up. Uh, blown as in, I am not clear. Blown up, destroyed, boom. So uh, is, is, is that a security mechanism they have built there? It is like a security mechanism. It is a huge depot of, of rockets and missiles and bombs and all that. It's an ammunition depot. And it's all serviced and kept ready. Uh, some, the, the Americans say it is all expired. It is too old. But, but you know, still they are interested. But just, yeah, but then why are, so, why are they so interested? See, just like medicines, arms and ammunition, e you know, there are parts, there are places in France, certain forests, where even today civilians are not allowed because they are full of bombs from the Second and First World Wars. Okay? Those are still dangerous. And the weapons in the Transnistria ammunition depot, they are not uh, 100 years old. Yeah. They may be 30, 40 years old. So it's still very much viable. It's a huge ammunition depot. If the Russians can take over Odessa, for instance, in the Ukraine conflict, if they can take Odessa and come to the Moldovan border, then they will be able to recapture and recover all that arms and ammunition. But you, you said that Russian peacekeeping forces are there. Yeah, but they're not connected. See, geography matters. The okay. Russian peacekeepers... So they cannot airlift or... Yeah, they can only be airlifted. But if you have a direct land connection, it makes more sense. And maybe the, the quantity so used that airlift does not make sense. Yeah, yeah. 
So if you want to use it in a war or something, you need direct land connection to be able to properly uh, leverage on that. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, I'm sure uh, people have questions, so please raise your hands. Uh, one of, uh, some of our volunteers will come to you, give you a piece of paper and pen, write it on, and uh, those questions will come to me, and uh, we'll ask that questions. Uh, so we move on to yeah. our next question now. Um, Eric Garcetti, uh, you have pretty interesting thoughts about him. Mm. Uh, he is aware, like he's been sent by US as ambassador after so long. Uh, what's the deal? Mm. Um, you have certain interesting points about him, so we would like to hear that. Right. So the US always has an ambassador in all major nations at any given point in time. But in the past 26 months, there was no US ambassador to India. They had something called a chargé d'affaires, means a person who is filling the gap of the ambassador. But they had not uh, appointed an ambassador for a gap of 26 months, which is the longest gap in the history of India-US relations. So the Biden administration did not appoint. and They had nominated Garcetti at that time, but he was not confirmed for whatever internal political reasons they had. So 26 months, no ambassador. Now they have reappointed Garcetti and the, the appointment has been confirmed by their uh, internal mechanism. And a, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe last week, Garcetti actually came to India. Okay, so he has come to India. Now let's understand and examine who this person is. Who is this person, Eric Garcetti? So first of all, he's a Democrat, a Democratic politician. He belongs to the same party as Joe Biden. And he is seen as a Biden loyalist. He's a career politician. And the highest uh, appointment he has ever had has been the governor, uh, sorry, the mayor, mayor the yes. mayor of Los Angeles. So he was the mayor of Los Angeles for close to 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. And this was the precise time period in which the city of Los Angeles has declined and, and essentially gone to the dogs. See, California used to be the nicest and most prosperous state in the United States. It was the sunshine state, you know, everything was good in California. Great weather, great business, Silicon Valley is there and so much more. So, and in the last decade or so, California has been totally run down. And cities like Los Angeles and California have become hell holes, essentially. There is crime rampant everywhere. The cops aren't to be seen. People do drugs blatantly, openly on the streets. There is homelessness everywhere, homeless people everywhere, you know, squatting on the, on the sidewalks and tents. And the, the municipal, I mean, you know, the, the municipal amenities are out there. So you have garbage all over the streets. People are pooping on the streets. It's become a disaster zone. And Eric Garzet, Garcetti presided over the descent of Los Angeles into hell. It was one of the nicest cities in the world. And today, you know, people, shops are boarding up their, their front, uh, front doors and all that because there is so much shoplifting. There are, there are laws that, that allow you to shoplift up, up to a certain amount of money. Oh, yeah, if it's yeah, up to a hundred dollars, yeah. you can do it and nobody will stop you. It's ridiculous. Thousand dollars? Yeah, yeah, I've heard Less that. than thousand. So, so up to nine 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 you can do. There are some shops which have um, marked everything above thousand dollars, even uh. if it's a one dollar thing. <laughs> then when you go to... Um, they will charge them, yeah. So they will discount you to one dollar. Because if anyone shop lives, they can actually call the police. So right, right. So that's what people are reduced to doing. That's what they've done. They've made shoplifting legal, essentially. And drugs is everywhere. Everybody does drugs. You can see people zomb walking like zombies on the streets. So this is something that Eric Garcetti presided over. He is what we would call in the classical media terminology, a liberal. And it means he's anything but liberal. But he's, he's classified as a real liberal person, a woke person, whatever you want to call it. And this guy, the highest job description he has had is the mayor of a city. Now, when you appoint an ambassador to a major nation, you would typically appoint a person who has diplomatic experience, high level diplomatic experience. So imagine that we appoint Shah Rukh Khan as the ambassador to the United States. Yeah? Or, or, or Ravi Shastri. <laughs> I mean, I, I respect Ravi Shastri greatly actually, you know. So it's, it's like that. I mean, Ravi Shastri has a great deal of experience and expertise and skill in the world of cricket, in batting, in coaching and all that. He has no diplomatic experience. So you cannot appoint somebody like him as a diplomat or as an ambassador. So this is what they're doing with Garcetti. So a guy with zero diplomatic experience or skills has been appointed as the ambassador to one of the largest and most important countries in the world. And even before he came here, 
Garcetti started making statements that I am going to look into India's human rights and democracy and, and uh, I will engage with civil society, which means that he will engage in sub-national activities. Regime change. Regime change operations and all that. So, so why, ha why are they appointing this guy now after 26 months of gap? It's because this is the year 2023. It is a very important year for India. Next year, we have something coming up. <laughs> yes, sir. We have the general elections coming up. And the US would very much like to see a weak government come to power in India because Mr. Modi and Mr. Jaysh Dr. Jaishankar are very, are very strong and they have a very strong and robust foreign policy which is very much pro-India. So it makes sense from the American perspective to have somebody else come to power yeah, in India. A weak coalition government with a very weak and pliable leader, that would be great. So that's why they have appointed Mr. Garcetti now and he's going to stir up as much trouble as possible in India. And we can see certain things happening in parallel. The moment Mr. Garcetti comes here, certain other institutions of India start acting up, which I will not name, but, but that's how it is. So Can you hint towards it? No, I cannot hint. <laughs> so listen, this year we're going to see a lot of trouble. I promise you that. And it's all going to be orchestrated from outside of India. Our foreign forces have a great amount of leverage within India, which is the 0.5 front that uh, General Bipin Rawat spoke about. The late General Bipin Rawat spoke about the possibility of a 2.5 front war. One is Pakistan, one is China and there is a 0.5 front inside India. This is the 0.5 front we are talking about. The internal uh, compromised people that are on the payroll of external forces. So Garcetti is, is on a mission to India. He has no interest in diplomacy or in strengthening US-India relations. He is only intent on creating more trouble in India. This is what I foresee. So this is a very important year for India, a critical year for India, crucial year for India, also for the US. In 24, they also have their elections. But we are not going to interfere in their internal matters. But they are going to make, make sure and do their best to interfere in our electoral process. And the, and the, and the process is already in motion. So uh, with this same uh, theme uh, of regime change uh, in India, last time in January when we uh, had you here, you said, uh, we discussed about there's a threat of war with China looming. But recently, there have been some evidences that China might not want uh, the Modi government to <laughs> change in 24. Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, look, I have always seen that the Chinese and the US have a certain convergence of interest when it comes to India. The Chinese don't like the fact that India is so much stronger now under the Modi government. And the Modi government is taking all possible measures to strengthen the border security, the, the infrastructure in the borders. And we are, uh, we are countering China with a very robust foreign policy. We are uh, uh, encouraging investment in India, in, uh, you know, encouraging uh, companies to move out of China and come into India and all these things. And we are building up the armed forces, so many things. So we now have a very strong military policy, defense policy and foreign policy. And clearly this is something the Chinese will not like. So this is how I've always seen this. But now things have changed. In 2019, at the end of the year, we had something new that came into the world. The pandemic, which came out of China, Wuhan virus. The, the pandemic destroyed China. The one major, the first problem the Chinese faced is that their vaccine doesn't work. Their vaccine has been the worst performing of all the vaccines. Because of that, they have been forced to place their people under horrible lockdowns for months at a, at a time. Because of this, their birth rates have dropped drastically. It's below, the total fertility rate is 1.1 now, which is a catastrophe by any standards. And also because of the pandemic, the world has stopped trust trusting China. Their Belt and Road Initiative is dead. Their Maritime Silk Route is dead. And without these two big vehicles, there is no way the Chinese economy will grow. And the world is now pulling out the manufacturing sector from China and trying to go towards other countries like India, Vietnam, etc. So the Chinese economy is doing very poorly now. They are saying it's still growing at 5%. I think it's actually contracting. The, the figures they're putting out are, are fake, are, are manipulated figures, most likely. So the demographic dividend has turned into a demographic disaster. Economy is shrinking. And the Chinese, if you look at any projection by any economist, the Chinese are no longer projected to surpass the US as the biggest economy ever in the 21st century. Now, in the 21st century, the only nation that is in a position to possibly surpass the US as the biggest economy is India. 
Okay, so China is going through a very terrible time, and things are going to only get worse for China. And now we have the additional U.S. pressure vis-à-vis -vis Taiwan, vis-à-vis -vis the sanctions, the semiconductor sanctions, and all these things. So the Americans are ramping up the pressure on China. Now imagine if there is a regime change in India, and a pro-U.S. government comes to power in India, a weak, pliable government comes to power in India, then the Chinese will actually face more pressure from India because India will become a U.S. vassal. A US puppet. So it makes sense for China now in this new situation to actually want Mr. Modi to continue in power because he at least stands up to the US and doesn't turn India into a US vassal. So that's why in this new scenario that we are now facing, President Xi Jinping would actually prefer to see Mr. Modi come back to power in 2024, which is so strange. But that's what lo the logic of strategy tells us. That's what is the current uh, affairs that is changing rapidly Very week rapidly. by week. Yes. Uh, so uh, I want to really highlight, uh, I want you to highlight one particular event which happened in the first week of April. China, without any warning, just encircled Taiwan hmm. and conducted its drills, what they say. But any light on that? So the Chinese claim that Taiwan is a renegade province, it, it belongs to China and it will be re reunified eventually in due course of time, that's what they say. There's a whole history behind that, we'll not go into that. Last year in 2022, when the then speaker of this, the house or whatever, Nancy Pelosi, she made a flying visit to Taiwan, the Chinese had said, that they had issued very strong and stern warnings, they had said that if she comes into the Taiwanese territory, we will shoot her plane down. Well, she came, she landed, she did whatever she wanted, and she, and she went. And the Chinese were able to do nothing at all. So then, in the aftermath of Nancy Pelosi's visit, they had encircled Taiwan uh, using their, their uh, navy and also through their air force. So for a few days, they had completely cut off Taiwan from the rest of the world. No flights were allowed, allowed to come in or take off and all that. So recently, they have again done the same thing. They conducted naval drills and military patrols around the island of Taiwan and encircled it. So this is something they are, they are doing on a fairly regular basis nowadays, you know, to, to, uh, to bolster their claim that this is our territory. These waters are ours and we actually own this island and eventually we will re reunify it. So it's, it's called creeping normalcy, it's called salami slicing. You slowly, slowly, slowly inch forward and make a situation which was not normal, completely normal. Because you, do, you keep doing it over and over again. So that's what the Chinese are doing. These are pressure tactics. And yet we have to understand that the Chinese are not in a position to take back Taiwan by force. Yeah, they Even are though Taiwan is right next door to China, if we see where Taiwan is, it is right here. Taiwan is right next to, to China. And still the, the Chinese are not in a position to militarily take back Taiwan because the US is still too strong for China. The US is the only superpower in the world which can be more powerful than China right at China's doorstep. So that's the situation. So that's how you also define superpower that mm. uh, at given notice in 30 minutes uh, that superpower should reach militarily. Anyway. So yeah, so my definition of superpower is that a nation that is in a position to intervene militarily anywhere in the world at 30 to 60 minutes notice, that is a superpower. The US can do it anywhere in the world at 60 minutes notice, any kind of military intervention. The Chinese can't do it. The Russians can't do it. The Russians can send nuclear missiles to visit any place for sure, but non-nuclear intervention, the Russians can't do it. Okay. So that's why the Russians are no longer a superpower, nor are the Chinese. The Chinese, the Russians, the Indians are, a gr are great powers. Some are greater, some are less great, but these three are great powers. But uh, along with the military, military might, there should also be economic might, right? Which Russia is nowhere near. Well, you build military might to safeguard your economic might. The reason why you need a world-spanning military is because your economic interests span the world. Okay. That's why the Americans have created the military that can you know, intervene anywhere in the world. Okay. Um, yesterday morning, there were some JNK bombings. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. We lost five uh, of our soldiers. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. So uh, many um, are saying that it, that has started the 24 elections that build up to it. Could be part of it, perhaps. I don't see Pakistan as a major threat or a major power. Pakistan is a proxy of other nations. For the longest time, Pakistan was financed and funded by the US. 
the Americans financed and funded Pakistani terrorism in India for decades. Then for a decade or so, the Chinese were the big daddy of Pakistan. But now Pakistan is back in the US camp after the regime change of Imran Khan. So now the Pakistanis are again controlled by the Americans. So if something is happening through Pakistan, let's not blame Pakistan for it. Let's blame the master. Yeah, because uh, throughout our sessions, we are actually seeing some parallels that US can be known as a terrorist nation now. You could justify what they're claim. doing. Uh, yeah. Even there was this viral reel that was going around where uh, on Fox News, there was one um, geopolitical expert who was saying, who was saying exactly what you have been saying since so many years now. Okay. So he just summarize that and he just used one word that US is the biggest terrorist uh, nation. Look, in look at the record. Who created the Afghan Mujahideen? Who created, who financed the formation of the Taliban? Who created Al-Qaeda? Who created ISIS? Even look into the details. Okay, so can you lit, uh, elaborate a little on the ISIS formation? The Americans made ISIS. And then they ensured that lots of ISIS fighters are integrated into Germany. Uh, and other European countries. So this was majorly uh, pushed during 2008 to 2016. I would I would recommend a book <coughs> called Black Fa Black Flags. Read Black that book. Flags. Uh, Black Flags. Do you know the author's name? I don't remember the author's name. We can Google it. Let's Google it, shall we? Black Flags. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Black <laughs> Flags <laughs> book. Black flag. Yeah. Flags book. <coughs> Who's the author? The Rise of ISIS? Joby Warwick. Joby Warwick. Black Flags, The Rise of ISIS. Okay. Uh, so last question from my side. Uh, there have been massive protests of similar kind in Israel and France, which the Israel still made a new uh, made a huge flash in the news because mm. the government is right wing. But France is not happening. Uh, can you throw some light <laughs> on that? <laughs> Look, we have to understand the big picture. Western Europe, if you look at Europe, the whole of Europe, West and East, there are two main powers. It's kind of like the Cold War situation. On the one hand, you have Russia. On the other hand, you have the US. So nations like all the EU nations and all the NATO nations, they're essentially puppets or, or vassals of the United States. The real power in Western Europe is not Germany or France, it's the US. There's a reason why Europe has not been at war for the past 70 years, because the Americans run, rule Europe. Okay? So when it comes to France, it is possibly the only nation in the EU and NATO that has a quasi-independent foreign policy. Okay. All other nations, their foreign policy is controlled and dictated by the US, including Germany, including Italy and all that. But when it comes to France, they have their own nuclear missiles, their own nuclear weapons, their own nuclear submarines, and a semi-independent foreign policy. So recently, Monsieur Macron was in Paris, he, uh, sorry, in, in Beijing, he met with Mr. Xi, and he made certain statements like, Europe should try to distance itself to some extent from the US. And nowadays, people are also using the word vassal to describe the relationship with the US, which they were not doing earlier. So uh, when it comes to France, there are ways the Americans can live, can, can, you know, there are ways of leveraging their assets within France to put pressure on the French government. So when it comes to Monsieur Macron, he is not a right winger. He is yeah, more of a centrist or maybe soft left. Soft left. Soft yeah. left. But he still wants an independent foreign policy. And that's why the Americans are pressurizing him by, by orchestrating all kinds of protests, etc. that they can do in any nation, including in India. We've seen that. Yeah, and uh, the similar uh, thing Israel. that is happening in Israel, I think it's about judicial reform. Ah, Israel is, is this a blueprint of what India, uh, when they try to do judicial reforms, is there a inspiration? So let's not talk about India, we'll talk about Israel. And okay. people can understand what's happening there. So when it comes to Israel, there is a certain... Uh, Israel does not have a written con uh, an official constitution. Oh. They have something called the basic law of Israel or something like that. You can you can Google it, whatever, what it's exactly called. So it is not officially written down, but the judiciary can interpret it whichever way it likes. It's like the basic... Uh, be, what do they call it? Structure. Basic structure of the constitution, right? Which is a completely imaginary concept in India, but the judiciary likes to quote that. A very similar thing exists in Israel. So it doesn't have an official constitution, but the judiciary can interpret this basic whatever it is in any way it wants. When it comes to the appointment of the judiciary, 
uh, the parliament is in a minority in the it is essentially the judiciary appointing itself if you look Similar into the details. To us. yeah so now the uh, netanyahu government wanted to amend all that and make the judiciary answerable to the people and the parliament it it wanted to mr netanyahu and his government wanted to give the parliament the right to to uh, to annul any law or any judgment that the uh, that the uh, judiciary passes if there is a majority in the parliament so it wanted to give the power back to the people right now the the judiciary is like an il- unelected so center of power in israel okay so these law this law that they wanted to pass was supposed to make the judiciary accountable to the people of israel and on demand tens of thousands of people come into the streets as if they are remote controlled from somewhere else and that's what happened throughout the day i'm just getting tweet updates that uh, the people who are uh, airport authorities they have gone on strike ports are on strike see how powerful the controllers are it's not easy to make airport authorities go on strike it's not uh, easy to make port officials go on strike somebody is so powerful they can do this on demand yeah and it it seems like that that it's on demand it's like on demand so that's what scares me that now liberals in india have got a blueprint what to do i i know it won't be that easy but so yeah it, it, it may be that easy perhaps it may be that easy okay that's that's actually there is all kinds of strife happening in europe first of all the germans are are doing such stupid things like shutting down all their or the all the nuclear power plants and burning coal how is this good for the environment but now according to their own uh, benefits now they are doing so it doesn't make any sense it doesn't have to have any logic as far as the the, the liberals do it it's fine so then obviously in in the netherlands they they are shutting down farms they're shutting down farms arbitrarily yeah th- this is one point uh, which is just uh, what are they doing uh, and they are saying that these farms are are, are emitting more carbon than or, or some stupid reason they are coming up with they've come up with and they're forcing people to shut down farms that have been running for generations but recently netherlands uh, these farmers went on protest they created their own political party they won i think uh, they, they, not, it's not been a big thing you know, as far as i know I, i don't know if it's netherlands but it's some country so yeah so there is all this strife happening in europe and it's all being orchestrated from somewhere else <laughs> okay look at germany what happened there isis fighters have been uh, you know settled in germany the same way uh, the neo nazis uh, that are supporting the zelensky government <laughs> and they are also being la- uh, allowed to land in germany yeah yeah for training place, yeah. and they are giving those nazi salutes in germany how is that allowed it's allowed if they if the americans allow it and that is not making news at all why will it make news people the will sanction them, them immediately right the media is controlled by whoever is controlling all this so that's how it goes here you can't say n word and now they are doing nazi salute yeah as long as the ukrainians do it it's perfectly fine they have a special exemption just one celebrity uh, pointed out that there are all jews at the top position uh, yeah, uh-huh. um, who is that um, uh, kanye west yeah so he within 2 days from a billion dollars his worth he can't even use his apple pay really yeah i see interesting so let's move on to q&a from our audience was winston churchill a greater demon then adolf hitler uh, is so yeah wild. yeah yes yeah <laughs> see see w- when we when we have two evil people we have two evil people we cannot there is no question about the fact that adolf hitler was evil of course he was evil he killed 4 million jews and romanis so some people try to make it sound like i am saying that hitler was not evil of course he was evil but how do we quantify evil when you have two evil monsters the only way to quantify evil the greater evil is to see how many deaths each person was respon- responsible for so hitler killed between 4 to 6 million jews and romanis churchill they try to say killed 4 million bengalis the actual figure will be around close to 10 million so from that very simple perspective churchill was a bigger monster than adolf hitler and we at least in india should stop uh, you know worshiping churchill or at least re- regarding him as, as a great there man there are bigger demons known as mao zedong mao and zedong, uh, joseph stalin, stalin so yeah. many other people there are 100 million plus right uh, uh, mao could have reached close to 100 million possibly uh-huh. and there may have been people in the past who may be bigger but i don't we don't quite sure because it's not been quantified properly um so 
okay uh, in in quick uh, answer if you can what is the future or the when can we see end of ukraine russia war uh, right now it looks like the war could go on for the next few years because it's it's it's, it's a very slow war right now so maybe ukraine could end up like the koreas the korean peninsula north korea and south korea or maybe someday in the in mr putin will decide that now let's go and take odessa then the, the russians will be able to reach up to transnistria so right now it's it's very hard to predict what's going to happen R the current position the current status is that it's a very slow moving war right now because uh, even you and many other geopolitical experts were expecting a rasputin winter over the, yeah. Rasputin, yeah it's not happened so the thing about a leader is that you should never let anybody anticipate what you're thinking and what you're going to do fool everybody keep them guessing or maybe all of you, uh, you experts make him derail his plan because you <laughs> guessed it <laughs> maybe uh, okay so there have been two some uh, like uh, w interesting deals uh, uh, i think uh, xi jinping went to russia and then china also brokered some peace deal between saudis which are sunnis and iran uh, shias hmm. so these two things um, how they play out so look uh, russia has come up with a new foreign policy document an amended or 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 uh, changed foreign policy document in which they have stated that the stated that two nations are going to be the number of, are going to be their top allies one is china one is india so and obviously we are part of the brics grouping yes. of nations we are part of the shanghai cooperation agreement so it, and and russia and china are very large nations the chinese need a lot of oil the russians need money they're getting money from oil sales to india other nations but also from china so it makes sense for china and russia even though they actually are long term adversaries to currently cooperate because they have a common bigger enemy which is the us so mr xi jinping went to to, to moscow yeah. he met with with putin the table was small this time not a huge table so the smaller <laughs> the temp table the better the relations closer the french yes so it was it was a good uh, meeting from from all accounts and uh, that went well then the chinese then the, the saudis and iranians have kind of made up and they did, they had broken off diplomatic relations for the past 7 or 8 years after the execution of uh, by the saudis of a shia dissident called nimr al nimr uh, but now they have reestablished relations and they have both publicly given the credit to china for brokering the agreement what implications that uh, that has for india uh, for india it it is not a bad thing but it it is a sign of the declining us influence in the middle east okay so the, if you look at the past several decades the middle east is always in crisis something or the other is always happening there there are so many tensions there but now with the decline of the us influence in the region you are seeing that everybody is making up the yemen war is about to end which was a proxy war between the americans and the iranians which was been fought by the saudis and the yemeni rebels so that is about to end now the uh, saudi arabia iranian uh, tensions are ending the israelis are making friends with the, with the saudis and other nations syria jordan perhaps so you can see with the decline of the us influence in the region the region is now cooling down and stabilizing and all the tensions are slowly decreasing so it's not bad or good for india i think it's good if the saudi the iranians can get to can you know get along to my together. question was uh, from the point of view that china is also losing its credibility after covid and uh, us is also weakening so is the uh, should india done should have done that instead of china what does india get out of it I mean so the Chinese the Chinese want to project themselves as a very large very major and very responsible world power right now they are still a very major nation they are the second largest economy in the world and they have this aspirations of becoming a superpower which is not going to happen but right now they are still a very major economy and a very powerful nation so they want to project an image that they are better than the US and they can succeed where the US has been failing for decades so that's what they're doing it's about creating a projection of 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 an image of soft power projection and all that and for india it's fine it's for india it's not a problem i don't think india should go and try to mediate in all kinds of fights and problems in the world what do we get out of it because saudi and iran want to join brics and now china is their way to in, uh, brics maybe india could have done mr. so they modi, have more support mr modi has excellent relations with mr mohammed bin salman uh, we have he had meetings yeah. uh, with these people oh, in recent times i'm sure i do remember that mr mohammed bin salman met with mr mr modi not very long ago in the past india has excellent relations with oman with the uae with iran also we have good relations so it's not like we are losing out and china is taking a march over us overall it's good for india if they come into brics 
in one of the previous G20s, Ma- Mohammed bin Salman was uh, like sideline, sideline, yeah. but only Modi went him yeah. and made him feel welcome, right? Yeah. So after the Jamal Khashoggi incident, which was in 2017, 18 or something, the journalist, uh, yeah, Saudi dissident journalist or whatever, he was uh, he was dealt with and his body was disposed of in a very particularly not nice manner, and the Americans then went after Saudi Arabia, the human rights and blah blah blah. The Americans have done far worse than this. Yeah. On so many occasions. But they blamed Mohammed bin Salman for this and they, they have tried to demonize him and all that. So he was sidelined in not just one but at least two G20 summits. Okay. He was placed on the complete sidelines even though Saudi Arabia is a very major nation. It was only Mr. Modi who spoke with him warmly and made him feel welcome. No other world leader would even speak to him. Not even China at that time? Not even China at the time. Okay. <laughs> um, very quick questions. Will there be another world war and when? Uh, I don't know if there will be a world war, I don't know when it will happen, but I can tell you what can trigger it. What can trigger a world war right. okay. is either the, U- see, it's, it's the US and its provocations either against China or Russia that can provoke a world war. So the flashpoints could be Ukraine, it could be Taiwan, it could be somewhere in the South China Sea. India and Pakistan are not starting a world war. If a India-Pakistan war happens, it will be over in five minutes. We need, uh, many people say we just need one or two missiles, right? We just need a, one proper missile strike and it's over. So, so Pakistan and India... Sorry? I think we are still very far away from a possible de-dollarization. The Americans will not give up so easily. There is definitely a significant uh, amount of interest in other currencies now. The world has realized the power of the US dollar and the, and, the, and the kind of sanctions the Americans can use to destroy any nation. We have many examples of that. North Korea, Iran, Russia now, which is failing. So the world is looking at other currencies. Maybe the Chinese Yuan, maybe the Indian Rupee, maybe uh, maybe a basket of currencies, you know, maybe the BRICS currency or whatever, but it's not going to happen immediately. It's not going to happen in the next two years, maybe next next five years. Maybe over a decade it can certainly happen. A significant amount of uh, bifurcation of the global order. Because it was said that Libya was destroyed because... Uh, yeah. They wanted to create an African currency and they had gold to back it up. Now the gold is not there. I wonder where it's gone. <laughs> Iraq, Iraq had a lot of gold. That gold is gone. Uh, major discoveries, inventions in West happened post their interactions with Indian greats like Swami Vivekananda and Indian scriptures, etc. Can we see any correlation? Uh, no, no. Okay, no. See, there we cannot try to mix science and religion, science and spirituality, science and philosophy. The Vedas are not scientific texts. Please understand this. Have you read the Vedas? Most people have never read the Vedas. And they say there is this and that. Have you read it? Which which chapter? I've just heard. Which verse? So, we c- see, science and religion are completely separate things. What is the difference? Let me explain the difference between science and spirituality. Or science and philosophy. Science is about the physical world. It's about physical objects and observational evidence and physical phenomena. What you can measure, what you can quantify, is that is what science is based on. Spirituality and philosophy is also about non-physical objects like the soul, like God. Can we measure the soul? Can we measure or quantify God? These are non-quantifiable, non-observable, non-measurable things. So science cannot go into the realm of spirituality or philosophy. Similarly, philosophy should stay uh, and spirituality should stay out of science because in spirituality and religion, there is an element of belief which is based on non-observation. It's based on simply belief. So I think I, in, from my perspective, it is wrong for scientists to ridicule philosophy and spirituality and religion. And it is also wrong for people who are, have religious belief to ridicule science. These are two things that cannot mix. They are by design separate. And I see no evidence of Swami Vivekananda being a scientist. He was a great spiritual leader, great saint, not a scientist. And the Vedas are not scientific texts. I do not, I uh, have the greatest of respect for our traditions and culture. But I understand the difference between science and, and, and religion. So let's not try to mix these things. Okay. I see no evidence of, of uh, Indian scriptures having given rise to quantum mechanics and relativity. I don't see that. But maybe uh, in some discussions, I'm not saying that it leads to that, but maybe it just 
enhances the imagination of a scientist to maybe try something so yeah interesting point so let me explain uh, when it comes to the science when it comes to the theory of quantum mechanics it's something that was, that was discovered in the beginning of the 20th century it, it took 50 years for people to make start making sense of it it is extremely strange even for a scientist there are things that are so strange quantum entanglement the, the you know retro causality the 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 superposition of states you know a, a, a particle can be in a superposition of states multiple places in one at, at one time until it is observed then there is quantum immortality there are so many strange things in quantum mechanics that don't make any sense we understand quantum mechanics enough to make use of its technologies semiconductors telecommunications fiber optics so many things would not be possible without quantum technologies so we know how to use quantum mechanics and make technology out of it but we don't understand how it works we don't understand how it works it is so strange at the quantum level at the ultra microscopic level and the phenomena that we witness in quantum mechanics if we read indian spirituality you see parallels there so it looks like our ancestors our ancients by exploring the inner universe they came across concepts and phenomena in their sensory experiences that kind of mimic or parallel those of that we see in quantum mechanics through observational evidence so that's why scientists who are at that cutting edge of the physics physics research they are drawn towards hinduism and hindu spirituality it doesn't necessarily mean that they have got the knowledge from reading the bhagavad gita or the vedas it doesn't mean that but they want to study these texts so that they may get some new ideas of how to solve these problems that are, that are so intractable so that's why people like Oppenheimer and Schrodinger and others have been so drawn to Indian, philo Indian philosophy. Um, maybe we go through again the, uh, this question quickly because you have talked a uh, lot about this. Can you give us a brief history about Nalanda University and I think even more universities, I, I, I don't know if they only specify about Nalanda. Uh, the texts that were destroyed um, due to the Mughal invasion. Mughal or Turkic or... Right, so the Mughals came later. So India was a land of universities. We had universities all across the length and the breadth of the Indian subcontinent, even in Gandhara, which is now Afghanistan. And the same system expanded into Indochina, what is called Indochina, into Swarnabhumi, Thailand, into Yavadweep, which is Java, which is Indonesia, and so on. We had the system all the way up to Vietnam and the Philippines. So the Indian education system was based on temples. Every town, every village had temples. In Tamil, there is a saying that if you that don't live in a village where there is no temple. So temples were not just centers of religion and worship, they were centers of education. You children were given education in temples. So in every village you will have small temples where you will, you will get basic education, like your kakha gaga and your basic arithmetic and all those things. In large temples, you would have more, you would ha have higher education. In viharas and mahaviharas, you would get very high education. And in the great Vishwa Vidyalayas, you would get the best education the world could give you anywhere in the world. And so we, India is the birthplace of the university system, of all education, of the proper education system. And we had universities like Takshashila all the way in Gandhara, almost in the, on the doorstep of Gandhara. There is the, the Mess Ainak Monastery in Gandhar, Afghanistan, which is now ruined, which is way in the north. Then you had uh, places like Nalanda, Telhara, uh, Sharda Peet in Kashmir, uh, Vikrampuri, uh, Vikramshila, Odantapuri, so many, so many. And so many of them, we don't even know the names anymore. So India was a place of education. And each great university, like Nalanda, Takshashila, etc., they had a great library. And we don't know about the other libraries, but the library in Nalanda, when, when it was burned, it burned for several months. So you can imagine how large the library was and how much material was stored there. And you can also imagine how much knowledge was burned when the library was burned. So they uh, ac accuse Indians of not being a historical people, of not keeping historical written records of our past. So what was burning in Nalanda? They when you go to a university library, when you go to a university library, you get texts on the sciences, on philosophy, on literature and history also. So clearly we had written historical records of thousands of years of our history. It was all destroyed by the Turks, not by the Mughals, the, the later ones, but by the Turks. 
around a thousand years ago. Bakhtiar Khilji and all that. And today near Nalanda there is a railway station called Bakhtiarpur. Shameless, shameful. So even they say that uh, the the library burned for six months or so. Several but months. Even took six months to destroy. Uh, I, I don't know how exaggerated it is. So what they did was they killed all the uh, monks, all the dharma gurus, and all the students, all the shishyas. They were all beheaded, thousands of them, and then the li- the university was they destroyed it. You know they bro- broke the buildings and they burned the library. And it is said to have burned for several months. I don't know if it's six months or less or whatever. Oh, several months. So. So this one is an interesting thing because I have no history about this. Mikhail Gorbachev was accepted all over the world. He had a huge following wherever he used to go. However, what happened to him in late 80s, we all know. We don't know. Uh, Modi ji is also accepted by major countries. But some set of media are not liking him in India. I, I might have read it wrong. Uh, is there any possibility of repeating Mikhail USSR into India, Khalistan for reference? Uh, I see no connections between or, or parallels between the life and career of Mikhail Gorbachev and the life and career of Mr. Modi. First of all, is this true that he was popular, accepted everywhere? If you have policies that benefit the US, you're going to mm-hmm. be popular there. Okay, that way. So he presided over the last stages of the disintegration of the USSR. He was the president when the actual disintegration happened. And, and afterwards, he was seen in advertisements for Pizza Hut. What? Yes, yes. You can see the advertisement on YouTube. It's still available. Wow. He was an advertiser for Pizza Hut after the break of, of the USSR. So Mr. Gorbachev was rightfully or wrongfully li- seen by his people as a Western stooge. So clearly, if you have policies which will benefit the West, you're going to be popular there. When it comes to Mr. Modi, I don't see him being popular anywhere outside India. The Pakistanis have no great love for him. The Chinese have no great love for him. The Americans... Democrats don't love if you, him. If you, all you have to do is to read the, the media, the Western media, whether it is the BBC, whether it is the CNN or Fox News or New York Times or, the, or Washington Post or whatever, the Guardian. Does any of them write anything good about him? Which tells you that he's doing something good for you. <laughs> Even Indian media don't. <laughs> yeah. Indian media. Uh, let's not name them, but we know who they are. So, <laughs> we, we have a very uh, popular conce- um, uh, conception uh, that Democrats don't like. Does it matter if it's Republican or Democrats? See, when it comes to the Democrats and the Republicans, see, the US has a two-party system, just one step above one-party system. And whether it is the Democrats or the Republicans, the foreign policy is the same. The Democrats, see the Republicans will use these black bombers to bomb a nation. The Democrats will take the same bomber but paint it rainbow. (laughs) And then they'll bomb the nation. That's all. Okay, um, I think we have reached very uh, good amount of questions, relevant questions. Uh, If I have not taken up your question, uh, uh, then so, uh, so sorry. But there would be some two minutes or three minutes with him where you can interact with him uh, after this session. So, so sorry if I have not taken your questions, but now we end here. Uh, So, thank you so much. Thank you.